Let's turn again to Luke, what? Acts chapter 1. Luke wrote it, but that's not the name of the book. The book is Acts. We want to be in chapter 1 again. We're going to read this text. Now, you, you might be wondering why the repetition, especially since we heard it twice last week. Well, because I've learned that repetition is the mother of, of teaching in a lot of ways, especially when it comes to the Scriptures. The more often we hear it, the more we're understanding, number one, the content of that text, but also how it fits together with everything else we've come to know. So I hope you don't mind the repetition. I'm actually not a big fan of repetition myself, but I've come to appreciate it at least. And so we're going to read over this again, and I'm hoping that hearing it again, um, you're just taking in the flow of the events, but also it can allow you to begin to understand the significance of the events too. Let's start reading in verse 12. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were, and I want to remind you, these are the the men whose testimony form the entire foundation of what we believe and who we are. So Jesus is the cornerstone and the capstone, but the scriptures tell us these men are the foundation of the church. So as I read the names, I do it slowly, just so that it's not a list of names. Remember, these are people. These are men. And they're the hinge. If they got it right, we're in good footing. If they got it wrong, we're fools. You see? So as, we, as I read the names, take this in. These men are very important to who we are. Those present were Peter, J- John, James, and Andrew. Those are the four fishermen that we learn about. Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas son of James. They all, by the way, how many are there there? I don't know if you counted, but how many would be there? Eleven. Wait a minute. It's supposed to be twelve. I know it. Jesus set up twelve apostles. I just know it. So what happened? Well, let's see. They all joined together constantly in prayer. That means in one passion, in one mind, in prayer, along with women, the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. I mentioned this before, but that is huge because his brothers were not fans. They did not believe. They did not follow. Something happened that they're worshiping with all these other people. They saw the risen Jesus. Game changer. Look at verse 15. In those days, while they're waiting, remember Jesus told them to wait in Jerusalem. In those days of waiting, what are they doing? They're praying. We just saw that. But somewhere in the midst of all that praying, Peter stood up among the believers. Just as a note, the word believers there is not a good choice. I really wish the NIV hadn't said believers. Not because they weren't believers. It's just not the best word choice. There's actually two options, depending on which Greek manuscript you're working from. So you'll see the different translations deal with this differently. In one, in one option, it says disciples. Now we're talking. Disciples of whom? Jesus. Why would they be disciples of a dead man? See, the reason these disciples are together is because they have seen their master alive. Otherwise, you go back to fishing, you go back to tax collecting, you go back to fighting Rome as a zealot, you go back to the way you had life before. If they're gathering as disciples of a man named Jesus, that's because they've seen him alive. You see it? That that word disciples is, is a big deal. The other option is brothers. I like that word too. Because that means that they understand themselves to be a part of something beyond themselves. Something unites them as family. Oh, beautiful. Anywho. So believers is accurate. I just don't think it's the best word. And it's not what the Greek said anyway. Let me get back to it. In those days, Peter stood up among the disciples or among the brothers, a group numbering about 120. And he said, Brothers and sisters, the scriptures had to be fulfilled in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David concerning whom? Wait a minute. I thought the scriptures were all about Jesus, right? All the prophecies are about Messiah. Why would the prophecies be about Judas? Because remember, a part of the promises about Messiah is that he would be betrayed so that he would suffer and die. Somebody had to play that role. And to quote Mr. T, Peter the fool, 
who plays that role. In fact, Jesus said it'd be better if he hadn't been born, the one who would do it. Now, after the fact, looking back with 2020 vision, they know who it is now. They have a name for that person. What's the name? Judas. Oh, This is the part of the story where our hearts turn very heavy because Judas should be a name in the list I read before. Judas should have been one of those. But because of his horrible, treacherous choice, he's now listed as someone that the Holy Spirit inspired David to speak of when he said the words we were going to read in just a moment. Concerning Judas, who served as guide for those who arrested Jesus, he was one of our number and shared in our ministry. He had what we have By the way, the word shared in the original language is allotted, and that means inheritance. He was an heir of what we have, gentlemen, as apostles. He used the power of God to bring healing. He cast out demons. He announced the kingdom message just like we did. He ate with the master. In fact, he dipped bread in the same bowl in the Last Supper. This man... I don't really spend a lot of time thinking about Judas. It's a tragic tale, but as I have done so, studying this text, my heart is heavy about that. It raises a lot of questions. Now look at what we find out from Luke in verses 18 and 19 about Judas. This actually is interesting because in Matthew 27, we learn about Judas after the betrayal. And there's a little bit of difference here, and it's interesting to think how this all worked. But here's what Luke reports. With the payment he received for his wickedness, what was that payment? Do you remember? 30 pieces of silver for the Messiah's life. That was cheap. That was real cheap. 30 pieces of, Messiah, of, of silver for Messiah's life. By the way, Messiah's life was valuable enough to purchase the entire creation. And he settled for 30 pieces of silver. Wow. Wow. With that payment, Judas bought a field. There he fell headlong. His body burst open and all of his intestines spilled out. Now, why do you think Luke is giving us that level of detail? That's nasty. Why does he want his readers to know that? Because he's explaining something, right? He's not just in it for the gross factor. Why does he bring up this whole way he died because everyone in Jerusalem heard about that so they called the field in their language Akaldama which means what? Field of blood see you wouldn't understand why they called it field of blood unless you understand the nastiness of what happened here's what's interesting in Matthew 27 we learn that Judas was so full of remorse after it was done after Jesus was arrested he takes the money he had received And he goes to the Jewish leaders whom he had conspired with and he says, I don't want this money. It's blood money. I've betrayed an innocent man. I'm really, I'm so appreciating what I'm seeing in Judas. Like, yeah, that sounds like true repentance. He gets it. He's switched of mind, right? And here's where the the Jewish leaders, if they loved this man and they loved God, they really could have helped him out. You know what they said to him? What business is that of ours? We don't want that money. It's blood money. We can't take that. They did nothing to help this man. They did nothing to to say yes or no to the fact that Jesus was innocent. Cold. We don't want that money. Deal with it your own self. You made your bed, now lie in it. Do you know what Judas did from there? Thanks to these men and their generous hearts towards him. He threw the money at the temple. And he left and hanged himself. You're like, that does not sound like what Luke said. So I'm trying to piece this together. Here's what I think Luke means. Because here's what Matthew tells us. With the money that Judas threw back, the Jewish leaders bought a field. And so when Luke says he bought a field, I I think what Luke is getting at is by giving the money over to the care of the Jewish leaders and they used it to buy the field, by extension, Judas bought it. And you're like, but wait, I thought he jumped headlong. Like Luke says. But Matthew says he hung himself. So here's how some of us try to understand it who think this through. Is it possible that he hung himself in such a precarious place in the field that, sorry, again, for the description here, but maybe 
once he had hung himself, it broke. Whatever it was, the branch he used or something, it broke, and so he fell. Like, could it all have happened the way Matthew and Luke describe it? Well, it doesn't really matter, the details, but here's what we do know. Tragic ending to what could have been a beautiful life for Judas. Now, here, get back to verse 20 with me. For Peter said, it is, for Peter said, it is written in the book of Psalms, May his place be deserted. Let there be no one to dwell in it. Now, if you have a footnote in your Bible, where do you see that quote is coming from? Does it tell you with a little, a little letter and it goes, points you to the bottom of the page? Psalm 69, 25. And then he quotes another thing here in verse 20. And may another take his place. Do you see where that comes from at the bottom of your Bible page? Psalm 109, verse 8. Please use those tools that your Bible gives you. When it gives you where it's found in the Old Testament, go hop over to the Old Testament take a look. You can't really understand why he brings it up unless you see where it comes from. Verse 21, Therefore, since the Holy Spirit inspired David to write these words about Judas, therefore it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us. Did you know there were more than 12? And we don't know how many. You're like, well, there's two candidates. must be 14. No, no, no. These are the two candidates that were brought forward that doesn't mean they're the only two that match the description. Because some of them may not be there anymore, whatever. But we end up with two that can actually be considered. But how many were there that had learned of Jesus, were following him day in and day out, had heard all of his teachings, had watched almost all of his miracles unfold? We don't know. We do know there's 120 left. That's... Actually, not all that impressive, <laughs> considering the multitudes he ministered to. But there's definitely more than 12, or 11. So, we need someone who's been with us the whole time Jesus was living among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his what? Why don't they need witnesses of Jesus' mortal life? Why don't they need witnesses of the teaching and of the healing? Because thousands had been witnesses to that. Amen? That was no secret. In fact, read the, as you read through Acts, you're going to find people are saying, now you know about Jesus. You know, you've heard about what's been happening. See, that was not something that needed witnessing to by these men. The death of Jesus and his suffering... Public event. Nobody, nobody was in the dark about that. that. That had been rumored all over the place. The one thing, the one piece of Jesus' story that needed witnesses like nothing else was the fact he's back, he's alive, and he's not just alive, like Lazarus or the 12-year-old girl or the boy at Nain. He's not just back alive. He is gloriously, immortally resurrected, and he's in charge. That needs Witnessing, So they're like, we need, a, we need a 12th guy to come in here and fill the number. Now, what do you think? Why do you think Peter is convinced that 11 is insufficient? Like, why do we need another one? So Judas dropped off. Okay, now we've got 11. Why not stick with 11? Well, do you think Jesus had a good reason when he chose apostles, authoritative spokesmen? Do you, do you think he had a good reason to choose 12? Or was that, that happened to be the only ones he had available? Obviously, he had others available. Jesus specifically chose 12 on purpose. And I, please get this. Peter trusted Jesus. If Jesus knew 12 was needed, 12 was needed. We're going to trust Jesus on this one. Now, by the way, Jesus made that decision a long time ago. But I trust his wisdom. Now, here's what's interesting. After the apostles start dying off after this, they don't replace them. In the book of Acts, James, the brother of John, is killed. We read about it. Beheaded by Herod the crazy. They don't find another one. They're not like, hey guys, we lost another one. We've got to fill the spot. Where's, where's uh, Barn Barnabas? Where is he? Or Barabbas, I mean. Where does he go? We need that twelfth guy in here. No, no. To begin the ministry... To, when they receive the Spirit and begin to testify to all of Israel, we need the 12 Jesus had in mind, right? So that's why it's necessary. So they nominate two men. Okay, this first man that's mentioned, he's not chosen. I just I want to invite you to think about poor, poor Joseph. He is up for the greatest honor anyone could ever receive in the entire world. 
to be an authoritative spokesman for Jesus. He's one of two. 50% shot, right? Finalist. His name is Joseph Barsabbas, which means son of uh, Abba, or Saba. And he's known as Justice, which would be his Roman Latin name, which means just. Sounds like he's a cool guy. He's a good guy, right? Who's the other candidate? Matthias. His name means gift of Yahweh. Which, I don't, that doesn't necessarily mean he's got great character, but apparently he does if he's brought forward. Now, how do they select? You've got two finalists, okay? How do you go about... If they meet the qualifications Peter gave, they've been with us the whole time, they experienced all of it, how do you decide who gets the, sh- the slot? <laughs> they've got no basis. They have no written test. You know, if you can remember more miracles than the other guy, you're in. Or if you can finish this quote from Jesus' teachings, you got the job. How do you decide this? What's the answer? How did they decide it? They go to... God. And number one, they pray, seeking his direction. And number two, they cast lots. Let's talk about it. Because that's weird. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two... Notice the next words. You have chosen. Did you catch that? You've already decided this, Father. You've already have this in mind. Will you just show us who it is? Oh, my goodness. This is the issue on the table for our church. Because we're talking about how do we know the direction of the Lord? How do we know where we're supposed to go? How do we know what we're supposed to do? If we have the vision in mind, that doesn't mean we know how to get to the vision. And so that's why I've been encouraging us to pray, to seek the Lord. And this is just another proof to me. This is where it has to start. This isn't a vague prayer they prayed in one mind and passion. Now we have a specific prayer to look at. And what he says is, I didn't even review that. What he says is, Lord, you already know the hearts of these two men. You've already made the determination who it ought to be. All we want to know is your decision. Brothers and sisters, I need to ask you, as we're at this portion of the text, are we at that place? where we can honestly say, because remember, he knows our hearts. We can't fool him. If we say the words and don't mean them, he's not a, a dummy. He gets it. Can we honestly come before the Father in a gathering like this one, and if we could all pray it together, Lord, show us what you have decided. Do we mean that? Because you know what the selfish, old self tendency is? God, here's what I've decided. Will you bless it? You with me? Lord, here's what seems right to me. Will you make it work, please? Anybody have ever prayed that prayer? Now, don't be ashamed because you have to mature out of these things. I've been there in my immaturity, and I'm still maturing out of this, you know, currently. But, Lord, here's what I would like to do or what seems like I should do. Please make it work for me. Hmm. That's a very different prayer than what they're saying. Now, here's what, if they were doing it in the flesh, here's what they would do. Lord, we have given them rigorous testing. We have vetted them thoroughly. We have chosen Matthias. Please make sure he's a good pick. (laughs) Please make him successful in the work we have given him to do. Now, Father, we are here at your behest. You are king. We are slaves. You make the call, and we'll live in it. Whoa. You know why that you you shouldn't answer this question too quickly? of whether we can pray that honestly together. Because as soon as you say that, you know what you have lost? Control. And let's not treat that flippantly. Hey, are you ready to lose control? Sure I am. I'm always ready to lose control. No, you're not. Huh. Think about how we live day to day. Are we really ready to lose control? This is why discipleship to Jesus is so hard. This is why people struggle with it so much. You have decided, when you joined the discipleship to Jesus process, you have decided someone else is in control. And I'm not going to be a mindless bot from here on out, but I have to trust him whenever he speaks. He overrides me. What? My plans, my purposes, my intentions are subject to change at any given time. Why? Because I'm a slave. 
Are we ready for that? Here's why this matters. I, as a pastor, as I meet with the elders, we can make all kinds of decisions, and we'll announce it, and here we go. Now, the church could override it, of course, because you don't have to listen to us, okay? Um, but, as, you know, in the leadership position, you can just make decisions, you say, here we go, let's do it, and then most people will be like, okay, unless it's bad, terrible, okay. You may not like it, you may grumble a little bit, but okay, here we go. But see... That's not discipleship to Jesus. That's discipleship to those people. Even when we understand what's going on in chapter 1 of Acts, even the elders of a church, the, the board of a church, any leader in a church understands the decisions they make are subject to the will of somebody else. What? And here's another reason why this is a struggle. How long will it take for God to reveal his will clearly? Do you know? I don't either. We actually do have to trust him to manifest his will in a way we'll actually understand. Have you ever lived in a situation where you want to know God's will, you have no idea how he's going to tell it to you, so you live in anxiety? Have you ever been there? Maybe it's a job decision. Maybe it's whether I should be with this person and get married to them. Maybe it's should I make this financial investment? Should I buy that house? You tell me. Or you're praying for God to do something. You don't know what he wants to do about it. We say, your will be done, right? On earth as it is in heaven. We say, not my will, but yours be done. And we mean it. We want his will to be done. But what's the catch? We're not always sure how we'll know what it is. Are you with me? Am I talking to you? Now, I really like the way they did it. Because they had a quick way to find out God's will. Have you ever been bothered by the way they determine this? Does it seem silly to anybody? Now, be honest. You don't have to be right, but it seems that way, right? It seems silly. God, you know the answer to the question. Here. Oh, good, we know now. Don't you want to do that all the time? Don't you want to cast lots to decide which house to buy? Cast lots to decide whether to marry or date that person? Cast lots to know which church you should be a part of? By the way, do you know what casting lots is? It's kind of a vague reference. So, okay. We're not exactly sure, but here's a very common way in the ancient world in that time they would have cast lots. Think about us doing that right now, okay? If you have clear choices that you're trying to choose between, here's what you do. This is one way they could do it. They would write on a piece of pottery, stone, whatever, something flat and hard. You'd write the name, in this case, of the two men, Matthias and Joseph. And then on two other things, you would have a blank and probably the word apostle or something like that. So you've got four, four tiles, okay? You put them into a jar, an earthen vessel jar, and you kind of do a little Yahtzee shake, all right? Get the die going. And then what you do, you either pour it out, shake it till it comes out, or you reach in and grab it. Now what you do is you pull out a name, or you pull out a blank or apostle. Either way, you're going to pull one out. Now if I were to pull out apostle, guess what? The next one's going to be who should be the apostle. If I pull out the blank, guess what the next one's going to be? The one who won't be an apostle. Now, why would you do it this way? That seems like such a petty way to decide something so weighty. The whole point is, and it's based on a a statement that's in Proverbs. It's It's a conviction deep in the Jewish spirit. God is in control of all things, even things that seem randomly chance driven. And in the Proverbs it says, people cast lots into the lap, but the Lord makes the decision. So here's what, they're they're basing this on the conviction. God, you know who should be the one. We're going to use a random seeming, a chance driven seeming thing, but we're going to trust that you're the one driving the process. Do you not want to use this process all the time? Oh, should you? It's in the Bible. What do you think? Should you do it? I will not advise you to do this. That doesn't mean God won't use it. I just cannot in full, con- full confidence say this is how God wants you to make your decisions. But isn't it interesting? They did that to choose the next apostle of God. Now, the whole point here is not let's cast lots to decide what to do next as a church. The whole point is this. Do we trust that God knows it and will reveal it to us if we seek his face? By the way, the idea that it was necessary to replace Judas is one that is debated. 
Some people actually think Peter did wrong here. Peter was getting ahead of God. There was, I, I was scrolling through people's things on, I googled it, you know, this text. And I was scrolling through, and there was a thing that said, getting ahead of God. I thought, oh, I bet I know what he's going to say. I click in there, I'm reading his message that he has on it. And this person who was teaching this text said, Peter, you're living in the flesh, brother. God was going to give you a 12th apostle with Paul later on in the book of Acts. You thought you had to fix this in your own fleshly way. You blew it. Matthias wasn't supposed to do it. He was living in the flesh. I was considering that. What do you think? Did Peter do wrong? And you're like, I don't feel like I have the authority to decide <laughs> that uh, the leader of the church was wrong. I actually, whether you take that view or not, I don't think Peter did wrong. What I believe, and this is a part of the point I wanted to bring out to you, I believe that when they were praying together, and has this ever happened to you? When you're praying for a, a, a prolonged time, you're really immersed in the presence of God. You're fully reaching out to Him and He is meeting you there. Isn't it true that you will sense things from the Spirit of what you ought to do? This has happened to me on numerous occasions. And so, it's very often very specific. I've done things simply because in prayer time something struck me and it, it stayed with me and I couldn't shake it. And I was like, okay, I guess that's you, Lord. And I went and did it and it was wonderful. I would never have thought of it on my own. It was kind of out of my comfort zone anyway. But I, I, this is what I understand. Peter had actually already received the Spirit in some way from Jesus. Did you know that? We're not to cha Acts chapter 2 yet when the Spirit's poured out on everybody, but we know in, from John 20, Jesus appeared in his resurrected form to the gathered disciples. We don't know how many. Peter was there. And here's what he says to them. Peace be with you. Receive the Holy Spirit. And then do you know what he did? <sighs> yeah, that's weird. <laughs> what? What just happened? The risen Christ, even before he goes back to Father, is authorized to give his spirit to his disciples. In some measure, I don't understand it fully, and here's how he distributed the spirit. It says he breathed on them. And I don't know, does that mean he went up to each one and went like, oh. I don't know. It wasn't just a big blanket breath. Who knows? That doesn't really matter. But get this. Peter had already received a measure of the spirit. And I don't think that he's left just to himself or the others are left just to themselves for these ten or so days of prayer. I think the Spirit's already moving, getting ready to prepare them. Because isn't this the point? They need to be ready for the mission when it hits. When the Spirit comes, they need to be ready to go. Just like when the Israelites in Egypt heard about the tenth plague, the firstborn's going to die in every household that doesn't have the blood. Do you remember how they were supposed to eat the Passover meal? Staff in hand, sandals on your feet, your tunic tucked in, because as soon as the word goes, we're going. We're not wasting time. That's the sense I get. Jesus said, wait for the power. Yes, wait. There's a waiting period. But as soon as it's go time, it's time to go. We don't have time to choose a new apostle. So I believe the Spirit was saying to them, and maybe it wasn't just Peter who got the message. Peter may have just been speaking for the other apostles even. The Spirit was saying, the Spirit, I'm going to be coming soon in my full expression, my full pouring out. And so when that time comes, I need a 12 of you to go, not just 11. We need a complete witness to this, right? So here, here's what I want you to consider with me as a church. In this time when it may not be super crystal clear what we're supposed to do concretely to move towards our vision, when I'm inviting you to join me in a time of prayer, of seeking God's face, as we begin to do it more and more together in our gatherings... I want to ask you to think with me, pray with me, Lord, what preparations are you going to be doing in us in this waiting time, in this seeking time? Because it's not dead time. Never. Uh, any gardeners in the house? Come on, I know there's a lot more than that. Yeah, y'all are gardeners. All right, let me ask you something. After you have planted and watered and you see nothing coming out of the ground, is that dead time? <laughs> there's so much happening that you do not see. The unseen preparations are going on for the emergence out of the ground, the fruit bearing later. And this is what I'm talking about. Are we patient enough, brothers and sisters? Honest question. Are we patient enough 
To trust God when we don't see anything happening. To ready ourselves. So this is what this comes down to. While we're in this waiting period of prayer and seeking, are you seeking holiness so that when the calling of God comes on us, you're ready to go? Or are you going to wait till then to start getting ready? Well, any athletes in the house? Come on. Do you wait till your first game to start practicing? Ridiculous. How will you do if you do? Loser. Okay, there's no way you're going to be ready when the game time comes if you used preparation time for nothing. And we, listen, we are up to something so much more massively important than any sports event ever. This is eternity and people's eternal existence that is, you know, on the line here as we deal in the kingdom message. So when I talk about waiting and praying, I'm not talking about dead time. Let's just do nothing. What I'm talking about is being aware that we're in a preparatory phase. Maybe I, as an individual, need to be focusing on the holiness that I am called to experience. I need to focus on being a better husband, a more godly father, a more uh, a proper friend. I need to learn how to deal with my neighbors properly. Because how can I be ready to go in the flow of the Spirit when He hits us with it if I'm still figuring out the basics? That's what I'm seeing in this chapter. We're not going to be picking any apostles here together. But are we ready to, in the quiet time, so to speak, to be in preparation mode? And asking the Lord, what would you change in me? What's incomplete in me? See, their, their witness wasn't complete. 11 out of 12. Let's complete it. Listen, there's something about the individuals here. And I don't know who or what. But there are individuals among us that if the Lord's call were to come today, you wouldn't be ready to go with him. Not because he doesn't love you, not because you don't believe in him, but because something's holding you back. And even as I say that, something might be coming to your mind. An addiction. A broken relationship you've done nothing to try to fix. There's something you know the Lord wants you to be doing, and you're just putting it off. Your prayer life is miserable, and you're letting it stay that way. You know what I'm saying? You, you, you've neglected the word, and you're like, I'm going to get to that. I'm going to get to that. I know I'm going. But right now, in this phase of our church's life, this is the time to get those things filled up so that when the clarity comes that we're seeking, let's go. Let's do it together. Because Pentecost is coming, y'all, for them. And now they're going to be ready for it. And our Pentecost... God willing, is right around the corner. We don't know how long until the clarity comes and we have the sense of agreement. Oh, here's what we're going to be doing now to get us to our vision. But I want us to be ready to walk when the call comes to leave Egypt, if you know what I'm talking about. One more thought. Notice that when he says, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen They cast lots, and it fell to Matthias, so he was added to the eleven apostles. I want you to think about Matthias with me just for a minute, because we're about out of time. I don't know anything about Matthias. Like most of the apostles, we don't really learn much about him in the Bible. I know what his name means. It's a Hebrew name. He's a Jew. I got that. And he's one of the twelve apostles. That's about as far as it goes. But here's what I do know. When he was called on by his church family, to have a radically different life than he probably had in mind for himself. What did he do? He stepped up and he did it. We have no idea what the conversation was like. Hey, Matthias, we would like you to be one of the people considered to be an apostle of Jesus the Messiah. You're going to be a witness with us. Your entire life is now focused on this one mission. Everything else is going to be put aside. What do you think, Matthias? I don't know what he said. But apparently it was the affirmative. And I don't know if it was like, oh, okay, if you think I could. Or maybe it was like, totally, I'm sensing it in me right now that this is something I maybe I'm called to do. Let's go, guys. Let's go. I don't know. You know what really matters, though? What did he say? At the end of the whole thing, before it was decision time, what did he say to the call? Yes, Lord. And you know, he, according to tradition, he died doing this job. His whole life, 
He expended himself to do something he was called by somebody else to do. He didn't think this up for himself. He probably had no idea this was going to happen that morning. And I want to ask you, are you willing? When the Spirit hits, the Spirit's moving, even if it wasn't your idea, even if your church family calls you to something, and it was like out of left field to you, but the, the community, not just one person, not just a pastor trying to get things done, but when the community comes together and says, brother, sister, I'm pretty sure this is what you're supposed to do. Um, what? But you know I got a life going already, right? I got stuff. Yeah. But we're sure this is what the Spirit wants you to do. My question is, will you cooperate? And I don't mean just with your church, with the organization, with the leadership structure. I'm talking about, our, oh, I went too far. What happened? What? Where did you come from? Yeah. My question is this. Are you going to cooperate with the Spirit of God himself? who will confirm his will through his people. And there's, there's a sense of agreement among us. And I'm not saying this because I have plans to do this and I'm trying to manipulate you to get you ready. None of that. I have none of this in mind. No specifics at all. Here's what I do know. The Lord's going to call some of us to very specific and big things. And I want to ask you now ahead of time, when the time comes, will you cooperate with him? Do you know what the word cooperate means? I mean, it's in the word. Co, along with, or together, what? Operate. Let's operate and work together with the Spirit. That is so wonderful and terrifying at the same time. Do you agree? Because the Spirit is this mysterious person. I can't see him. I can't touch him. I hardly ever hear him audibly, if ever. And I haven't ever heard him audibly. He's in charge of everything, and he wants to work with me? What? I want to so bad, and I'm so scared of what will happen if I do. Anybody else? It's the most exciting thought in the world, and it terrifies me. So here's the question. Will our trust in the Master outrank our fear of the Master? (laughs) Where will he take us? What's this going to mean for my schedule? What's this going to mean for my everyday life? What's this going to mean for my finances? Is my job okay? You know, all these questions. Because he could decide anything. Is my trust outweighing my fear? And if the trust outweighs the fear, you're living in discipleship. Because he says to you, follow me. Not admire me from a distance. Applaud me as I do my thing. Follow me. Come work with me. Let's do this together, which means wherever I go, you go too. Trusting me that you will not only be well, you will have the greatest, most exciting and fulfilled life possible as disciples of Jesus Christ.